a very good morning to all of you. On behalf of the, the SLMA, as well as the Palliative and End of Life Care Task Force, I would like to welcome Major General Dr. Sanjeev Munasingh, Secretary of the Health, Health Ministry, uh, and all the other distinguished guests who have attended to this important event. Today, this event is important in several ways. Uh, one is, this is the first ever end of life care guidelines being published today and the book is being launched. The story of behind this uh, end of life care guidelines is amazing. If you uh, have known about the palliative and end of life care task force, it was established a decade ago. And the, one of the main objectives of having this task force is uh, developing end of life care guidelines because we did not have proper guidelines in end of life care for the practicing physicians, healthcare professionals, as well as poor patients suffering from life limiting illnesses. So that was the main target. And after uh, five years, after five years, now we are having the end of life care guidelines uh, with the participation of all the stakeholders, multidisciplinary professionals. We have developed with much, much deliberation the end of life care guidelines of Sri Lanka. Another way, this is important because after a very successful year amidst uh, COVID-19, but fighting hard against that, the SLMA, our president, madam, and the council uh, is going to have this as the last event of the year and we are having our AGM tomorrow. So I think it's a nice way to uh, end the year with end of life care guidelines, which was one of the uh, dire need of the society. So uh, with that introduction, I would like to invite Major General uh, Dr. Sanjeev Munasingh and President Madam uh, Padma Gunaratna to the head table to proceed with the event. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. So the SLMA, as I told, had a very challenging but successful year and our uh, guiding star was the president of the SLMA who spearheaded the council. So I would like to invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna, president SLMA, to welcome you all formally. Madam, how about you? Uh, good morning to all of you. Major General Dr. Sanjeeva Munasinghe, the Secretary to the Ministry of Health, uh, members who represent the Council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, the authors of the books that were published, past presidents, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome ever so warmly Major General Sanjeeva Munasinghe, the Secretary to the Ministry of Health, to the headquarters of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. As you know, Dr. Sanjeeva Munasinghe was initially a consultant radiologist. Then he was the Director General of Army Health Services and also was the president Sri Lanka College of Military Medicine. Quite a while later, he was appointed as the secretary to the Ministry of Health. I have known Dr. Sanjeev Munasinghe for a decade as a neuroradiologist and his work at all times was nothing less than perfect. We have been liaising particularly with regard to reporting for neuroimaging, for which I have direct experience with Dr. Munasinghe and the reports were all the time perfect. I'm pleased that despite his busy schedule of work, 
he was humble enough to accept my invitation for this book launch, a most kind gesture, which means a lot to the president and the council of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I'm also very happy to most cordially welcome all other dignitaries and invitees for this ceremony. Your presence is a source of great strength to all of us at the SLMA. The primary objective of the Sri Lanka Medical Association is the development of professional skills of the members who are all qualified practicing Western medicine. Since of late, with the need of multidisciplinary team care for the management of many conditions, it's important that we understand that the doctors are unable to work all alone, but do need to work as team players. That's why we have made our theme for the year as professional excellence towards holistic healthcare. In keeping with our theme for this year, we have conducted many activities that focus attention on nurses and allied health personnel, as well as making such allied health care personnel as resource persons in some of our programs. In fact, particularly in this year at the SLMA, we have been concerned on the skills development of nurses and allied health professionals even a little bit more than any other years. Publishing a book by the association is yet another feature to support the commitment of the SLMA for professional development. End of life care and the palliative care manual for healthcare professionals in Sri Lanka were done by the end of life care and palliative care task force of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the guide to stroke rehabilitation for healthcare professionals was done by the SLMA expert committee on medical rehabilitation in collaboration with Association of Sri Lankan Neurologists. The content of some of the books published such as end of life care are totally new to the medical profession in Sri Lanka. By publishing books, we wish to highlight that in some of the areas we lag behind significantly when compared to many developed countries, the need to forge ahead in those endeavors. We try to pressurize the government on the need to improve these areas in hospitals in the Ministry of Health. For instance, there is a need to establish geriatric care services. There's a need to establish stroke care services, palliative and end of life care services in hospitals of the Ministry of Health. There's a need to improve coordination between the public health services with the Ministry of Social Empowerment and Welfare. I for one certainly believe that these books that were published by the Sri Lanka Medical Association will bridge the gap in knowledge that is seen among us and eventually will enhance the quality of care provided for those relevant patients. Once again, I do welcome all of you to this simple ceremony to launch books, including the one on end of life care published by the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. Today, we are having a very simple ceremony here, and we have invited a limited crowd here because of the uh, health restrictions related to COVID-19. Yet, we have a very important guest here with us who, have, who has uh, joined online. We are honored to have Professor David Oliver from University of Kent, UK, to be with us 
and to deliver the keynote address here today, the only uh, speech that is going to have related to the end of life care today. Professor David Oliver has recently retired from the full-time position as consultant physician in palliative medicine at the Wisdom Hospital in Rochester, UK, Kent, and is an honorary professor at the Desired Center at the University of Kent. He has lectured and published widely on neurological palliative care, particularly on the care of people with motor neuron disease. He was clinical lead for the National End of Life Care Program document End of Life Care in Long-Term Neurological Conditions, a framework for implementation. He was the chair for the UK National Institute for Health and Care Excellence Guidelines, that is NICE Guidelines, on Motor Neuron Disease, released in February 2016. Oliver has been involved in many projects across Europe in chair, as chair of the EAPC Task Force on Neurology and Palliative Care and co-chair of the Palliative Care Speciality Group of the European Academy of Neurology. David is chair of the research group on palliative care of the World Federation of Neurology. He is a fellow of the European Academy of Neurology as well. David has written widely on the palliative care and symptom control of patients with neurological disease and was first author of the, of the EAN EAPC paper, a consensus review on the development of palliative care for patients with chronic and progressive neurological diseases, uh, which was published on European Journal of Neurology in 2016. We are honored to have such a giant in a neurological palliative care here with us today. And uh, I welcome you, uh, Professor David Oliver, and over to you to uh, deliver the speech on care at the end of life, patients, families, and professionals. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed for uh, that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here with you. I'm trying to make sure it all works. Uh, thank you and con thank you very much indeed for everyone for inviting me and particularly the SMA. I'm very honored to be here and very pleased to see this wonderful publication and congratulations to everyone who's involved in the publication. I'd just like to spend a few minutes talking about what end of life care can involve and some of the issues that face patients, families, and us as professionals. One of the most important areas I think is in the report is when do we recognize the end of life? And when is the end of life? For many people, it's the last year of life. And there are two ways that we sometimes look at that. There's the surprise question. Would you be surprised if this person died in the next year? And often that's our gut feeling. But there are other indicators, and I put a, a reference at the end. There's um, SPICT and the Gold Standards Group have also come up with the sort of indicators of decline, the general physical decline, decreased activity, more advanced disease, repeated admissions to hospital, often unplanned, and multi-morbidities. So have we, are we starting to be aware of this person becoming iller and that the end of life is near? And the supportive and palliative care indicators tool suggests, are there signs of worsening health? Again, of unplanned admissions of general health, someone needing more care, someone who's lost weight, someone who has symptoms that are troublesome, or is it the patient and family are saying, I feel that things are more difficult and that I need palliative care? And I think there's the other aspect when we're looking at the a real approaching death within the next few days. And this was the Liverpool Care Pathway idea that actually we 
have stopped in the UK, but I know is well used across the world. And it's the multi-professional team have agreed. It's everyone has discussed this together. This is a patient who is dying and that they may be bed bound. They may be only able to take sips of fluid. They may be semi-comatose and they're no, oh, no longer able to take their tablets. And if two of those aspects are there, and often they're all there, there's a real awareness that this person is someone who may die in the coming day or two or few days. It's not 100% and someone may improve, but it starts to make us think, is this person deteriorating? Because I think we need to be clear that we discuss the issues, whether it's in the last year or in the last few days. We need to be clear and honest. We need to listen to the patient and the family. We need to share as a team to support each other. And we need to be aware of our of emotions. There will be emotions from patient and family and also our own. And what words do we use? This was the words that were tended to be used in, in the UK. Lots of different ways of saying someone is dying, someone is ill, someone has died. They've passed over, they've, they've passed away, they've pegged it, they've croaked. Lots of different ways, but I think in many ways we have to be really honest and say, this person is dying. This person is, has died. Why is it important that we know that someone is becoming inner? Because that knowledge alters what we do, what treatment and interventions. And we need to have decision making that takes into account what's going to happen. If someone is going to make an informed decision, they need to know the positives and the negatives, the benefits and the risks. It gives them a pop, a, opportunity to prepare. Uh, do they need to do their will and testament? Are there issues within the family? Are there issues about their funeral they would like to say? We need to have support of the patient and family and the professional because we all have our fears of what's going to happen when someone's deteriorating about death and dying. We need to make sure that symptoms are really well controlled. And it's an opportunity, if it hasn't been undertaken before, to make plans ahead, to make an advance directive or to set a proxy. And I know those are discussed in the document. This is so that if I cannot make the decision myself because I'm much iller, people will know what decisions I would like made. And I think they're general principles that we need to do. We need to assess symptoms whether that's the last year or the last weeks. We need to look at medication. Does someone who is going to die in the next few weeks or months need their statin to stop them having a heart attack in 10 years time? Do we have medication available if there are symptoms for pain, for sickness, for agitation, for those ch chest secretions that are often at the end of life? Have medication available quickly so that it can be used if it's needed. So there aren't delays in getting it there to the patient. And are there reversible things that we need to be doing? If it, and are there reversible changes? Is that possible? Is it appropriate or is it acceptable? I always remember some patients with hypercalcemia, perhaps with bone secondaries from carcinoma of the lung, we find the calcium is raised, but actually you can see they are very imminently dying and it's not really appropriate to start treating that. But at other stages, it may be a way of helping their symptoms and helping them feel more comfortable. Do we explain to the patient and family what's going on? Do we manage the symptoms really well? And in the last few days, are there treatments and interventions that we can discontinue? Having an oxygen mask on actually stops communication. Can you talk to your family, kiss your wife if you have an oxygen mask on? 
is it actually doing anything? If someone is not hypoxemic, oxygen is not going to be very helpful. Intravenous fluids, I know, is always an area of great discussion, but are they appropriate? Are they helpful? And I've seen in hospital people having their IV fluids treated rather than the person. The, the blood is taken from one arm and the, the fluids are checked and changed on the other arm and no one notices the patient in between. Do we need to know the blood pressure, the temperature, the pulse, the blood results if we're not going to act on them? And actually does that cause distress? And all through this, it is supporting families. It's involving families. It's listening to them, explaining, allowing the expression of emotion. And there may be very variable emotions. There may be fear. There may be anger at us, which we have to take and listen. There may be confusion and hopelessness. And we need to encourage people sharing those feelings as much as possible. And then I think there are particular issues when we're coming to end of life about the continuation or withdrawal of feeding and hydration. Very, very different views within people, within families, within the team. Ventilatory support, if someone is on ventilation, where do they want to be cared for and where do they want to die? And those are often two different issues. And I'm sure we've all seen patients who have been at home and the family want to be at home, but when it becomes very obvious they're going to die very soon, want them taken away to somewhere because we've actually discussed place of care rather than place of death. And are there particular wishes of the patient? Are there practical issues? If during that last year, there may be things that someone wants to do, visits that they want to make, family they want to see? Are there cultural or religious aspects that someone would like to do to meet their cultural, their religious leader to have those discussions? And we can only find those things out by listening to the person. And as I said, there are many ethical issues. Are we withdrawing treatment that is already there? Are we withholding treatment which we feel is not appropriate or not going to help that patient. And at the end of life, that may include intravenous fluids. And there's very, very variable evidence on that. A NICE guidance in the UK said there was no strong evidence that IV fluids altered the last few days of life, positively or negatively. There is very little evidence. There is some evidence and some feelings that actually they may add to the, the problems of a patient. Do we carry on with feeding? But feeding is so important for, for families. Do we give antibiotics? But antibiotics will only work if that person has some fight and resistance of their own. Do we give cardiopulmonary resuscitation or is this really appropriate and we should allow the person to die? In many areas, the do not resuscitate order is actually called, called allowing a natural death, which I think is much easier perhaps for patients and families to understand. And ventilation is a big area where there can be real issues. Do we stop ventilation and the person dies? Ethically, all the ethicists say there's no difference between withholding and withdrawing. However, I have pressed the button on a ventilator of someone with motor neurone disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and they died a few minutes later. And I have felt that I've caused that death. I know in my brain that the ethics are correct, the legal aspects are correct, but my heart says, you press the button, the person died. And there was a need to have a discussion between my head and my heart. There isn't ethically, we can withdraw and we can withhold. And we need to look at what's the most important thing for this person. 
if the person is asking for that treatment to be withdrawn, we should try to facilitate that. But our intention is important. important. My aim in reduce, removing that ventilator was because the person did not want to carry on having that ventilation. It was not to kill the patient. And if the person can't capacity, we need to ask them, they have the autonomy. If they haven't capacity or cannot make that decision themselves, we may have to take in a, in a best interest decision. So many ethical issues that we have to discuss and think about. And that can cause issues between the family and also within our multidisciplinary teams. There will be varying views. There will be fears about talking about dying and death. Most families have issues that have gone on for years. I don't talk to this person, they don't talk to me. I, I, I never believe what they say. We all have that in our families. And those issues won't get better when someone is dying, they may actually get worse. One of the most important things that comes out from patients and families of professionals need to give consistent messages. Having two or three different doctors on two or three different days saying different things is very difficult. And feeding is seen as such a basic need. He can't starve to death. I'm sure we've all had that. But we need to explain that actually feeding someone may actually not alter what's happening, but may cause them more problems and more issues. And I'm sure we've all seen families trying to feed someone who's swallowing is very, very poor. And we can see if they carry on with that, they're just going to cause an aspiration. But we need to sit down and listen and find out what's happening behind what they're doing. So thinking about what are the aims, and I think comes over in your booklet, it's listening to patients and families, helping them to talk about the future. And with advanced care planning, we're more and more aware that actually sitting down with someone when we think they're going to die in the next few months and just talking about death and dying probably won't actually help them. We need to talk about what's important to them now, next week and next month. And in that relationship and those discussions move on to the later stage. We need to help team members cope with planning ahead in these, dif these difficult discussions and conversations. You know, we all have our stresses. I always say in the UK, doctors have no issues with stress. We just happen to have a very high divorce rate, a very high death, uh, uh, suicide rate, a very high drug use rate, and, uh, you know, but we don't have stress. But do we support each other with some of these conversations and what is happening? At this time of year, I always think we had one young lady in the hospice who um, her, came in on the 23rd of December and died on the 24th of December. She had a baby who was about 18 months old. And I went into the nurse's office and left very quickly because I found five nurses and the chaplain and a doctor and a big box of tissues that was going down very, very quickly. They were all sharing and crying together after the death of this young lady. But that was important for them. Once they shut the door and came out again, they were professional, but they needed that time to share together. We now need to plan for the best, but consider the worst. And that's what I often would talk with patients. And what comes over, I hope, in, the, in your booklet, and as I've seen, and, and in our care for people at the end of life, we need to assess and review and do that again and again and again. We need to think about unnecessary medication and interventions. We need to make sure we are treating what is important and that medication is available. Symptom management is essential and supporting families and carers is essential, and anticipating and preparing. 
And one final thought, I was very lucky. I was actually worked at St. Christopher's Hospice in London while Dame Cicely Saunders was still um, working very much part-time in the hospice. And she has a very profound uh, phrase of how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. We have a big responsibility to the person who is dying, but we have the same responsibility to those who are left behind, who will remember what we have done and what we do. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor David Oliver, for that fabulous yet simple and clear presentation. I think you beautifully touched the human and humane aspects of the palliative care. And uh, we don't uh, forget that it's 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> this morning, uh, this, uh, today, now. So thank you very much for being up at this moment. It is five, about just six o'clock. And I am 25 degrees, I'm 25 degrees cooler as well than you are in Colombo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for that commitment, dedication towards palliative care. We are honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the exercise of developing the end of life care guidelines was not an easy task. It involved multidisciplinary team, including legal fraternity as well as public. And that's why it took about five years amidst COVID-19 pandemic and all to develop these guidelines. And it was not a simple task at all. When we were thinking of this task, our chairperson, Dr. Dilha Samaravir, and our convener, Dr. Dhyangani Ramadasa, wanted a dedicated person to lead this task. And that is a must to have a committed leader in any important task to go ahead with that. So we have that person here with us. Professor, Professor Tashi Chang, Professor in Neurology in Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, who chaired the guideline committee of developing end of life care guidelines. Sir, this is your opportunity to introduce the development of palliative care task forces end of life care guidelines and introduce how it was done. Over to you. Good morning, everybody. Our chief guest, uh, Major General Dr. Sanjeeva Munsinger, our guest speaker, Professor David Oliver, President SLMA, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, past pre presidents of SLMA, members of the Palliative and End of Life Care Task Force, distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, let me thank Professor David Oliver for accepting our invitation at rather short notice and delivering a wonderful talk that has set the platform for me to introduce the publication that is being launched today. Life has a natural end. And once a patient has entered the dying phase, no amount of medical technology or innovations can prevent death. The focus then needs to be on palliation and maintaining patient dignity while ensuring the best possible quality of life until the very, very end. We have been practicing end of life care based on our experiences gained during clinical training and our knowledge of end of life 
care guidelines of other countries, mostly of Western cultures. However, it has been long realized that we have cultural traits that are very different to Western cultures. And the need for local guidelines was a felt need. This was the backdrop in which a group of interested medical professionals from multiple disciplines were gathered together by Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna, the then president of the SLMA in 2017, to convene as the end of life care guideline development committee to develop end of life care guidelines that were pragmatic, scientific, and socially, socio culturally applicable to us. I do not know how, but somehow I found myself chairing this committee. The initial draft of the guideline was adapted from the guideline, treatment and care towards the end of life, good practice in decision-making, published by the General Medical Council of the United Kingdom, and then subject to a series of revisions to adapt to guidelines to suit the local setting and the social cultural characteristics. One may wonder why it took us almost four years to compile a guideline of just 30 pages. Partly the pandemic was to blame. But the true reason was that we had many dilemmas and obstacles. On one hand, the guideline, unlike any other guideline, addressed a very sensitive subject that was close to heart to most everybody uh, in this country. On the other hand, we had to be extremely meticulous and accurate to detail as to not to breach any of the prevailing laws and legal principles of the country. And in the process were faced with many issues that still did not have any legal cover in Sri Lanka. In this context, I am particularly grateful to Justice Jasanta Koda Goda, President's Counsel, who prior to his elevation to the judiciary provided us with relevant legal counsel, and Dr. Hemamal Jayawardena for scrutinizing the final draft for any legal flaws. We presented a preliminary draft to representatives of the many colleges and associations of medical professionals in Sri Lanka and incorporated their comments into the final draft. The 30 page end of life guideline comprising 19 subsections is the first detailed guideline of its kind in Sri Lanka and is organized into an easy to read booklet adorned by a meaningful cover concept. The oil lamp on the cover that you will see, the oil lamp represents homage. The flame denotes life. The flame gradually diminishes and eventually dies out as the oil depletes. The hands of compassion that embraces the oil lamp gently sustain the luminosity as long as the flame burns. And that has been our theme throughout in the end of life care guideline. This guideline is addressed to healthcare professionals. However, it may also help patients and the public to understand what to expect of their doctors in circumstances in which patients and their families may be particularly vulnerable and in need of support. This guideline is not and cannot be exhausted. Furthermore, each patient circumstance is likely to be unique to the patient and their families and merits an individualized approach. Thus, the healthcare professional must use his or her clinical judgment in applying the principles in this guideline to the situation faced in the end of life care of the individual patients. 
Let me end by extending my sincere gratitude to all the members of the end of life care guideline development committee. There were many at the beginning, there were some dropouts, but there was the hardcore who remained to the very end, to the end of life until it got published. Also to Justice Kodagoda, Dr. Jayavadana for their intellectual contributions rendered voluntarily and free of charge. Dr. Sand Sankar Randani Kumar, the dynamic secretary of the palliative uh, care and end of life task force who has been a live wire behind this task. Mr. Upula Amrasinga, our graphic designer. Ima Kemi for sponsoring the printing of this guideline. And last but not least, Mr. Taranga Fernando, business manager of Ima Kemi for ensuring that the end product met my obsessive demands. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that count of memories. I think, for, as you told, almost for four or five years uh, while we were developing the end-of-life care guidelines. And now the moment has come to launch the publication, the practice guideline in the end-of-life care. I cordially invite uh, Professor Tasi Chang, uh, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, and also uh, Dr. Dilva Samaravira, our chairperson of Palliative and End-of-Life Care Task Force, along with our convener, uh, Dr. Udayangani Ramadasa to uh, present the first copy of the practice guidelines in the end of life care to uh, Major General Dr. Sanjeev Munasinghe, Secretary to the Health, of, Health Ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, in addition to launching this book, the practice guidelines in the end of life care, uh, the SLMA has published a few other books as well, few other publications as well within this year. So uh, let me, uh, so we are, we are going to actually introduce and present those publications as well. So uh, now this is, uh, about the uh, SLMA guidelines and information on vaccines, which is a well-known book, the latest edition. And the introduction will be given by um, Dr. Lucian Jayasuriya, past president of, uh, president of the SLMA, as well as the editor of the publication, uh, the vaccine guidelines. Over to you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Our chief guest, Mayor General Dr. Sanjeev Munasinghe, Secretary of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, President of SLMA, past presidents, members of the council, members of the expert committee on communicable diseases, authors of chapters of seventh edition 
of the cell image guideline information of vaccines, authors of the other books that are handed over today. I'm glad to give a short introduction of our book on behalf of my joint editors. We have five editors, Dr. Omala Gumilaratna, who is here present here today, Professor Jennifer Pereira, Dr. Geetani Galagoda, Dr. Rajiva De Silva. Ladies and gentlemen, the SLMA Guidelines on Information Vaccines is a project started in the year 2001, 20 years ago. I'm glad to have seen the launch of seven editions of this book, uh, of which I have been a coordinator, the coordinator and joint editor. The seventh edition should have been launched last year. The delay was due to COVID. The subject objective of this book is to educate and update healthcare professionals on vaccines and vaccinology. It is a practical use to doctors and nurses, especially to those who administer vaccines and to medical students and postgraduate students. Coming to history, in 2001, the SLMA Committee on Communicable Diseases found that the immunization handbook produced by the epidemiology unit of the Ministry of Health, discussed only the vaccines that were in the state sector. Therefore, we decided that there's a need to write a book on information and to information about the, of the use of vaccines that were available in the private sector also. This led to the first edition called the SLMA Guidelines on Non-EPI Vaccines, which was launched in 2001. The popularity of this book led to the publication of the second edition, launched in 2004. We discussed all vaccines, both in the government and private sector, worldwide in Sri Lanka, and it was named SLMA Guidelines and Vaccines. By the third edition, the name was changed to SLMA Guidelines and Information on Vaccines. We have published book, this book almost every three years. Each edition has, been, has expanded with additions of new chapters. On the seventh edition, we, we started work in May, March 2019. We have had 40, 40 meetings at the SLMA discussions. All it was completed in third year to third quarter of 2020, we could not launch it due to COVID. Five new chapters have been added, making this a book of 372 pages with 37 chapters and six annexes. 10 new chapter authors were included, making a total of 29. The authors are consultants who have expert knowledge on the subject. They include a variety of specialties, a family physician, an obstetrician, a gynecologist and gynecologist, a venereologist, community physicians, pediatricians, epidemiologists, microbiologists, virologists, and immunologists. All chapters are revised based on current scientific evidence. There are chapters on all vaccines in, available in Sri Lanka, except the COVID vaccine. This is because we had completed our book when COVID vaccines became, were becoming available. In addition to chapters on topics related to vaccines, such as adverse events following vaccination and transport and storage of vaccines, there are chapters on immunization of special groups such as super sports persons and elderly and immunization in pregnancy. A copy of this book is available to any member of the SLMA who requests a one. It is in the SLMA website and could be accessed by anybody. It is available for sale in the SLMA for a nominal sum. The contents of this book could be reproduced provided the author of the chapter is printed. I wish to thank Jackson Smith Klein for funding the publication of this, of this book for the last seven editions. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, sir, for introducing the vaccine guidelines. Now, uh, we are going to introduce 
uh, another publication of the SLMA, that is Guide to Stroke Rehabilitation. The introduction would be done by Dr. Ajini Arsalingam, Professor in Medicine and Consultant Neurologist, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Jakarta. Ajni has to inform me at a short notice that she is unable to come. But then, uh, uh, anyway, and I had been behind this project, so uh, I'm quite competent in um, introducing the book. The, um, as you know, a stroke is a leading cause of death. Uh, all over the world, it's the second leading cause of death. Here in Sri Lanka, it's about fourth or fifth leading cause of hospital deaths by knowing that many of deaths in this country happen at home. So the, the care for stroke, I mean, many strokes could be treated, about 80% of them, they could they improve based on the concept called the stroke unit care. So we have been taking so many attempts, so many uh, methods to uh, uh, lobby the government, to uh, pressurize the uh, uh, clinicians uh, to establish stroke unit care in the Ministry of Health but it is just like the public transport in this country, just like the way that we do not have a reasonable, a decent public transport system, stroke unit care also is, it's sad to say that we still have been, uh, have not been able to establish a decent stroke care for people in Ministry of Health. So this is just yet another attempt by, uh, actually I, me uh, as the convener of the, uh, SLM expert committee on medical rehabilitation that uh, for each and everything, the knowledge matters. So particularly the knowledge of clinicians, the doctors matter so that we wanted to conduct the, uh, the uh, stroke unit care for clinicians, uh, the training program that was carried out for doctors with funding for World Health Organization. We conducted it as a pre-Congress workshop of the Sri Lanka Medical Association annual 134th annual uh, anniversary international medical congress so the book was published as part of this project and the book consists of as you know that in stroke unit care there is multidisciplinary team involvement so that the book has been contributed by all i mean all the authors consists of the members of the uh, all the members of the multidisciplinary team so it has about five uh, chapters made by the neurologist with regard to the, um, the epidemiology of the available services and the basic needs to establish the stroke unit care and so on. And then the disabilities and the, uh, the uh, scope of rehabilitation and recovery. And then uh, uh, after that, it carries chapters on the contribution from nurses. The, the, the people who have authors that to, who have contributed the book is the best available in the island, in, in country, because all authors are from Sri Lanka. So it's from nurse, nursing staff. We have a contribution for a, a chapter on nursing for stroke care, yeah? stroke. And then there's another chapter for physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, and the social services for stroke. So the, basically this is a book that would be useful all grades of doctors, as well as for all the nursing and the allied health professionals. So we have uh, uh, printed about 150 copies and uh, uh, the book was launched and uh, 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 it would be a very good uh, uh, tool for stroke to establish stroke unit care uh, and uh, could, that could be used by any of the healthcare professionals. Uh, so the book is available. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam, for introducing the book, Guide to Stroke Rehabilitation. The final uh, publication we are going to introduce today is another publication by the uh, Palliative and End-of-Life Care Task Force of the CLMA. Uh, that is the Palliative Care Manual for Healthcare Professionals in Sri Lanka. Actually, this is the second edition of uh, such book. This will be introduced by uh, the convener of the task force, uh, Dr. Udayangani Ramadasa, Head, Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, Sabaragamu University of Sri Lanka. Madam was the pillar of strength and the library behind 
the, uh, publishing the first edition as well as the second edition of this book. The floor is yours, madam. Thank you, Sankar. Major General Dr. Sanjeeva Bunasingha, uh, President SLMA, Dr. Pasmuk Patpagunaratna, past presidents of SLMA, uh, members of the Palliative Care and End of Life Care Task Force, and distinguished guests. Uh, we all know with the advancement of science and technology and this epidemic of pandemic of non communicable diseases people live longer with disability and suffering uh, with life limiting illnesses. So when the cure is not possible, relief or suffering is the cardinal goal in medicine. And it is the philosophy of palliative medicine. So keeping all these things in mind, in 2016, the palliative and end of life care task force was commenced during the presidency of Professor Chandrika Vijayaratna. And uh, during that period, the Ministry of Health has recognized palliative care as an uh, emerging need in Sri Lanka and the National Steering Committee of Palliative Care was already established. And the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine has recognized palliative medicine as a separate independent specialty. And uh, it was the time to commence the postgraduate diploma of palliative medicine. But we all know the palliative care for cancer patient is quite well known in this country, but the introducing the, uh, introducing the palliative concept in non-cancer patient is, was very limited. So because of that, it was a need during that time to develop a manual for uh, management of non-cancer patients, a guide for healthcare professional. That was the first edition and it was used as a, a, ref, a referring book for the PG diploma in palliative medicine as well as it was held for the trainers as a trainer guide as well. And with time uh, we realized and we understood that we have to have a full comprehensive manual for all the healthcare professionals in Sri Lanka uh, to, uh, to use as in their day-to-day -day practice as a palliative care manual. So the second edition was loaned recently with palliative and end-of-life care task force, uh, the palliative care manual for healthcare professionals in Sri Lanka. So in this uh, manual, initially during the introduction, we have uh, given the main concept of palliative care and then the next few chapters, we have addressed the skills that the people should, the healthcare professional needs to develop when practicing palliative care, effective communication, team building and record keeping. And we have uh, given chapters, detailed chapters, how to do physical symptom control, pain, nausea, vomiting, neurological symptoms and so on. And then uh, we have, there are a few chapters that how to incorporate palliative care in different systems. For example, palliative care for patients with progressive neurological disorders, palliative care for patients with respiratory disorders, and then the nutrition and hydration, palliative wound care, palliative care emergencies and oncology settings. And we have, uh, we have considered, we have given, uh, written few chapters on uh, special categories of patients like elderly and the pediatric palliative care. And we have not stopped there. Uh, we have uh, written few chapters on home care and discharging home uh, and ethics in end of life care, last days of life, end of life, uh, managing patients during the terminal phase. And we all know that the palliative care won't stop at death. So it will continue even during bereavement. So there's a chapter to cope with loss, grief, and bereavement. So this is a comprehensive manual that we have developed uh, for, and uh, it can be used uh, as a guide in all health uh, healthcare hospitals. And um, I would like to thank the, all the authors, as well as the editors 
for developing this uh, country for their hard contribution uh, to uh, develop this uh, comprehensive big manual of palliative care. And in fact, there were overseas Sri Lankans also have contributed uh, in writing this book. And uh, the not the and last, not the least, I would like to thank the uh, Merck, uh, the same um, uh, same pharmaceutical company, and Mr. Taranga for sponsoring, all sponsoring of this uh, uh, big manual, and he has actually given thousand copies uh, of this big manual um, for uh, uh, SLMA. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam. And now we have come to the uh, the final uh, fi uh, end of the program with presenting those books that were published by the SLMA in the year 2021 to our chief guest, uh, Major General Dr. Sanjeev Munasingna, Secretary, Minister of Health. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Lushan Jai Suriya to present the book on the SLMA guidelines and information on vaccines. And our president, Dr. Padma Gunaratna herself will uh, present the book, The Guide to Stroke Rehabilitation in Sri Lanka to Major General Sanjeev Manasinghe. Thank you, Madam. And uh, Dr. Udyangani Ramadasa and Dr. Dilha Samaravira will present the book, Palliative Care Manual for Healthcare Professionals in Sri Lanka, the second edition. So before uh, calling today, we have our chief guest who has taken his time despite his very busy schedule, Major General Dr. Sanjeev Munasingh, Secretary to the Ministry of Health here with us. Sir, please uh, talk a few words to the audience and uh, we are very much thankful for you to be with us here. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, Presidents of Sri Lanka Medical Association, past presidents and council members of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Professor S. P. Lamabal Surya, one of my teachers, and authors of the publication, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure I address you in this special location of launching the practice guidelines in end of life, along with three other books published by SLMA today. This year, as I was told, the practice guidelines in end of life is the first ever Sri Lankan guide for end of life care. I take this opportunity to thank all representatives of professional colleges, legal advisors, and the SLMA task force on palliative care for fulfilling 
this long-awaited need of this country. The other three books, SLMA guidelines for stroke rehabilitation done by SLMA expert committee on medical rehabilitation, SLMA guidelines and information on vaccines done by expert committee on communicable diseases, and palliative care manual for healthcare professionals in Sri Lanka done by SLMA task force on palliative care. We'll also provide much needed guidance for healthcare professionals. Though the year 2021 was engulfed by COVID-19, SLMA has served for many activities to improve the knowledge and skills of medical and allied healthcare professionals. Regular webinars, workshops, conferences, clinical meetings, foundation sessions, and annual congress under the leadership of eminent president. I am aware that CSR project of SLMB, COVID Sahana, has provided medical equipment for more than 50 hospitals of the country. SLMA Doc Hall 247 has helped many patients of this island with much needed medical advices, and it has reduced unwanted hospital admissions during this pandemic. All these provide evidence of SLMA activities and commitment of the president and council of SLMA. And their tenure is ending on 22nd of December, that is tomorrow. I wish to express my sincere gratitude to all of them and wish all the very best for the forthcoming oncoming president and council for year 2022. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant day. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for being here with us as well as uh, encouraging us with those lovely words. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have been assigned to give you the vote of thanks on behalf of the SLMA as well as the palliative and end of life care task force of the SLMA. So let me first uh, thank thank you, uh, sir, uh, Major General Dr. Sanjeev Munasinghe, Secretary to the Ministry of Health, for your commitment shown by being here with us on the last event of the SLMA. I think we have we are honored to have you on this day the, uh, of the last event of this council of the SLMA. Uh, despite your very busy schedule in this time of COVID-19. Thank you, sir. And uh, I would also like to uh, thank uh, the members of the Palliative and End-of-Life Care Task Force, as well as the members of the Guideline Development Committee of the Palliative and End of Life Care Task Force. The, the members of the Expert Committee of Medical Rehabilitation, and also to Dr. Lucian Jayasuriya for coordinating uh, with the, the, the members of the Guideline Development Committee of the Vaccination Guidelines. Thank you, sir. And uh, our president, Dr. Padma Gunaratna, and Secretary, uh, Dr. Sumitra Tisera, even though she's not here, were always pillars of strength behind us. Uh, thank you, Madam. And uh, also uh, to all you all who attended the, uh, the function today. Um, I would like to give a, uh, I would like to uh, thank especially to uh, Taranga Fernandu, who is here, the business manager of Merck, uh, who sponsored both uh, publications of the uh, SLM Palliative and End of Life Care Task Force, I think without any conflict of interest. So uh, thank you very much, Taranga, for uh, that. And 
uh, on behalf of the SLMA, I thank you and your company. Uh, last but not least, I would like to uh, thank the office staff of the SLMA, including Vihanga, who is here for technical support. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I think we, we, have, uh, we are marking the end of a very successful but challenging year of the SLMA with this event. Uh, I think uh, this was a very uh, nice uh, time uh, to be, have you all here because we have, I think, uh, served the suffering uh, patients uh, with uh, life-limiting illnesses uh, and the healthcare professionals who, are, who were in need of much needed guidelines with this uh, uh, practice guidelines on end of life care. So marking the end of another successful year with such a great work, I think would be memorable. So thank you very much, you all. And uh, the lunch is ready for you. So you can join us. Uh, outside with lunch. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you.